Hey guys, welcome back to Legit Street Cars and welcome to another CL65 AMG video. Now, normally I start off the introduction of my videos with a basic outline of what we're gonna do in the video. I like them to be structured, beginning, middle, end, some kind of result, you guys know the deal. I'm kind of done doing that with the CL65. So normally I would say we're gonna do a bunch of repairs on the CL65 because it constantly breaks and then we're going to the dyno but the truth is at this point in time, I don't know what's gonna happen, but that is my goal. But if something breaks on the way, there's nothing I can do about it. So anyway, uh, cross your fingers, do a little dance, wish me good luck, let's get right to work. All right, we're gonna start off with something I'm most excited for, and that would be the hood struts. I've had this car for about a year with bad hood struts, so I've had to do this little walk right here to this side, and then worry if this hood is going to decapitate me. Yeah, see, it doesn't always lock in. And then I gotta do one of these. I gotta hold it up here. Okay, all right. And then, come on now. This one always gets stuck. There we go. Then I gotta, there we go, all right. Then I gotta do one of these. I don't fully trust it. It did fall on me once, it kinda hurt my head, um, but anyway. Let's do these struts. All right, I got Peter holding the hood up because I just don't trust that little tab. And these are really easy to do. I remember we used to charge like a half hour of labor to swap these out at the dealer. And you can see it's just kind of oily and greasy and it's just like a normal shock. It's just gone bad. It should be way harder to do than this. Well, here, I'll show you. I can't even compress this by hand. That's how they should be. And they just snap in. Snap that one on very easy. Okay, we're done. Thanks, Peter. Luxury. This is great, hold on. I'm still gonna use the service position. It's obviously easier to work on the car. But now, if that thing fails, the hood will actually stay up. It's a beautiful thing. All right, let's move on to some more real repairs here. All right, so if you guys remember in the last CL65 video, we installed the quad cone intake and then went outside and had a little bit of fun. Now after coming back from that fun, I discovered some coolant on the ground. I kind of freaked out thinking that maybe it was coming from the engine. And then I lucked out and found that it was coming out of the radiator. So there's a little crack at the top of the radiator on the driver's side and this is a common point of failure on these cars. So we need a new radiator. At the same time, I'm gonna replace these hoses because they have these plastic connectors with a seal in there and after you have them on and off so many times they can start to leak. The hoses are original anyway, so we're gonna do upper and lower radiator hoses. And we're gonna be doing some transmission work as well, replacing a conductor point. This is also a big point of failure on this car and really any Mercedes transmission from this era. Very good transmissions, but this part would fail all the time. This connector would leak. So anyway, I'll go over all of this once we drop the valve body. Um, but of course, I went with fcpeuro.com for these parts because of their lifetime parts replacement guarantee because it's a CL65. And honestly, the only way you can really own one of these cars is with a lifetime parts replacement guarantee. All right, so I'd already removed the fan to diagnose the coolant leak. So we're gonna start off by removing these tens here. And we'll take off these little radiator brackets. And it's been a while since I've done one on this model car, but I think we can sneak the radiator out from here instead of having to take off this whole thing. We'll, we'll see, it might be easier just to remove this. And then we can just reach down here and loosen up the drain for the radiator. Goodbye, new coolant, basically. Oh, and you gotta take your cap off. There we go. Now we have the coolant draining. And I'm a little bit bitter about doing this because this is pretty fresh coolant from the engine rebuild, but at the same time, we're doing a coolant flush on the fresh engine too, so I guess it's not all bad. All right, so right now I'm removing the trans cooler lines from the radiator. And I was just thinking about this, but most of the parts on this car that I've replaced are from FCP Euro with the lifetime parts warranty. So if this thing keeps breaking, I'm gonna have the first CL65 that's under a full mechanical lifetime warranty. It's gotta be worth something. You go ahead and keep breaking CL, I dare ya. I'm just kidding, just, just please stop, just stop. I've removed this line right here, and if you're removing the engine fan, definitely take this loose, it'll make life a million times easier. And then we just have the other trans cooler line at the bottom. We'll take that off too. All right, we'll remove this clamp here. Now we can shimmy the hose off. These just have these metal connectors. You just gotta pull down with a little pick tool. Don't do what I'm doing right now, but if you're replacing your radiator and the hose anyway, you can get violent. Do not do this, guys. Do not do this. You will break stuff. 
There we go. You just gotta fight with it a little bit longer, but we're replacing both, so who cares? All right, last up we have this lower radiator hose to remove. And I'm trying to show you guys that you don't need a pry bar. You really don't. It's really super easy. And Mercedes totally should not have just used a normal hose and hose clamp. This is better. The best or nothing. The best or nothing. Ugh. Nothing to see here. Nothing at all. Ah! Okay, I got it with the pry bar. Don't do this at home. Just struggle with it for longer, it'll be fine. Why couldn't you have just fallen right there? Why? Well, I was gonna say next up, we have to remove a 10 from right there and one from right there, but they're missing. So thank you, previous mechanic who took this all apart. Could have at least left the bolts in a cup holder. So now we just have this 10 here and this 10 over here. All right, now at this point, we've unmarried the radiator from all of the many coolers that the CL65 has. There are a lot of them. There's a little guy in here, this one here, we have an AC condenser. There's another cooler sandwich in there somewhere. Uh, but now we've detached that and we can kind of just move this radiator out a little bit and see if we can sneak it out without having to remove all of this. This should be the last piece we need to remove before the radiator comes out. And that is this little bracket that holds on our intercooler water pump. And you can see here, it just screws right onto the radiator. Oh, and there was another 10 right here that holds these AC lines to the radiator and that should be it. All right guys, so I have the radiator loose, but unfortunately I have to remove this little spider web of hoses. These are ABC and power steering hoses that go to the coolers and they're getting in the way of me removing the radiator. So they gotta go. Lost a little bit more fluid, but What's, what's another few gallons of this super ridiculously expensive Pentacin fluid? Why not? Now will you come out, radiator? No, no you won't. Okay guys, I'll show you when I get the uh, old one out, but these, these are what gets in your way when you're trying to take this thing off, along with those little spider web hoses I took out. Now, in theory, this should come out. It is such a tight fit, people. And I've, I mean, there's nothing left. Nothing left around this thing. It's just, you gotta shimmy it. It's gotta be a special, it's like, it should be a cheat code for this. Shimmy to the right, shimmy to the left, shimmy to the right, shimmy to the left. And then, and then it comes out. Whew. All right. Okay. There we go. That wasn't the hardest radiator I've ever removed, but it definitely wasn't fun. And. I need a drink. And my drink of choice for 2022 is AG1 from Athletic Greens. Mm. This stuff is so good and it makes keeping my New Year's resolution of being healthier so much easier. AG1 is a daily supplement packed with 75 different vitamins and minerals and other whole food sourced ingredients. And I've been drinking it daily for a few months now and it's helped with so many things. I'm always super busy and I used to drink a ton of coffee and I've given up coffee entirely now because I drink AG1. So this helps me maintain my energy levels. It also supports the immune system and it helps with recovery because it's packed with superfoods and adoptogens, including magnesium. So it helps me recover from workouts or a long day on my feet out in the shop. AG1 is vegan, paleo, and keto friendly, and you can take it on the go with their travel pack. So this has really helped me kind of declutter my cabinet that had been taken over by a whole assortment of supplements. If you guys are interested, and doing something healthy that you can actually stick with and that tastes delicious, I look forward to this every single day, then head over to athleticgreens.com slash legit streetcars or click on my link down below. When you do, you're gonna get a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. So a big thanks to Athletic Greens for supporting my new healthy lifestyle with AG1 and for continuing to support automotive content creators like myself. Now, with that, let's go support my broken CL65 with a new radiator. All right, guys, I'm feeling good. I got some nice blue gloves. Let's swap a couple things over to the new radiator. So don't forget these nuts right here. 
and right here. And you can use the pick just to slide these out, just like that. And then they just fit into this groove on the new one. Push that in a little. There we go. And we'll swap this little hose. It's just easier to get to the other end. This isn't a bad spot on the car. And I'll put that in the same orientation, make sure it's clocked properly, just like that. We have these little rubber isolators. Swap those over too. And then I always take this guy and just save it, just in case later on you break one of these off in a radiator, you got a spare part. And not that this was a common failure point on this particular model, but it is kind of nice at 136,000 miles that we're replacing the internal transmission cooler right in here, because if those do fail, it'll mix the transmission fluid and the antifreeze. And if antifreeze gets into your transmission, it'll pretty much destroy it. So that was an issue on some 2003, early 2004, 211 cars, but it wasn't really an issue with this, but uh, we don't need any more issues. So this, this makes me feel good. All right, we're ready to go in with the new radiator. And you wanna be a little bit more gentle reinstalling the new one than you were muscling out the old one. Now it can get frustrating taking a radiator out. But you just gotta be patient so you don't damage the fins. They are aluminum. They are very delicate after all. I don't wanna have to do this again. Okay, so with this guy just laying in here, I'll get these on. So these are just little extensions of the air intake tubes that go through the radiator. And they just slide in here and kind of snap in. Kind of hard to see, but that's pretty much about it. It just snaps into place and you're good. All right, now we're gonna feed in our little spider web of hoses through here. Like I cannot touch any part of this car without it being somehow related to the ABC suspension. And this is that part. These are, two of these are ABC hoses. All right, so you really can't mess this up as far as the length of the hoses. They all kind of line up the way you'd think they would. And you can reuse these factory Mercedes clamps. Just get yourself a nice pair of side cutters and you're just gonna compress them together. When you hear the snap, you're good. Okay, so I've attached both brackets on the side of the radiator the one on the passenger side that holds in the intercooler pump and the other side holds in an AC line. So that's done. We have our top seal on and we can just slide the radiator right into place. All right, and then we'll install our little brackets, zip them down and don't go too crazy with these because these are plastic, you will crack them. There we go, let's tighten these guys up a little bit by hand. All right, cool, our radiator is installed. Now we just have to reconnect everything around it, replace some hoses, and we're moving on to a transmission service. Kind of an in-depth one though. Got the new lower hose almost on. And let's see here. This usually goes on a lot easier than it comes off, usually. Oh, look at that. Like butter, like butter. Perfect. Now this one goes right here. And we are almost there. We're almost at the promised land with this radiator. So the low radiator hose splits off into this hose here, goes to the bottom of the coolant reservoir. And this is all the fun stuff. Putting it back together, you know where everything goes because you just removed the old one. It's a beautiful day here in Chicago. Spring just started, it's 65 degrees out. Everything's good, everything's good. And I didn't totally just jinx myself. There's no way, there's no way in this car. Everything's gonna be fine. Don't worry. About a thing, cause every little thing is gonna be all right. All right, let's get this guy back on. Got the new upper hose as well, already installed. We got a couple two tree bolts to put back in. You guys ever hear a couple two tree before? Now you have, it's a Chicago thing. All right, we'll reinstall our new upper hose, like so. There we go, give her a good old tighten. Eh, click, click. There we go, that's torqued. Okay, um, I think, yes, at this point we can get coolant in here. All right, so we're using the Mercedes factory coolant. I'm putting it in at full strength right now, but we will be diluting this down to 50%. I know I'm gonna need two gallons, so that's why I'm not pre-mixing. Here's our water. All right, it's pretty much full right there, but once we run it, it will cycle a little bit more. Normally I would vacuum this down and fill it that way, but my little vacuum connector is broken, so. Uh, anyway, at this point, I'm not gonna start it because I don't wanna hook up the transmission cooler lines and run the old fluid through the new cooler. Let's, uh, let's hit up the transmission. We gotta drop the pan and the valve body and I'll show you guys what I'm gonna do in there. Of course, that's the video. I'm gonna show you everything. Fluid doesn't look too bad. I don't have any service records on the transmission fluid ever being done. A lot of these weren't done because technically you didn't need to replace the fluid. 
Um, but the transmission works pretty well for the most part, but I'll talk to you guys about a little issue that it's having and what we're gonna do to fix it here after we get the valve body down. All right, with all the fluid drained, we just have a total of six T30s to remove. Actually seven if you count this one for the little bracket that you have to remove. All right, then we can just simply bring our pan down. I put a little piece of cardboard on the ground as well, because if you don't have a large drain pan, you're gonna get fluid on the ground. And then we'll just pull the filter out. Next up, we have to remove the electrical connector. So you're just gonna pull down like this, pop it out. Let's see, eh, it's pretty dry. A lot of times this is soaked in fluid and this fluid can actually travel all the way up the wiring harness to the transmission control unit and it can short it out. And the whole issue is this connector right here that I'm about to take out. It's just a seven millimeter. These are like 10 bucks, but they can cause like a thousand dollars in damage. And I saw these when I worked at Mercedes leaking on brand new vehicles that were still on the transport truck from Germany and just a puddle of red transmission fluid underneath them right on the transport truck. So they had a lot of issues. They came out with like four different versions. This is the latest with the black seals. So that's why we didn't have the leak. So this has been replaced probably like five times. With that, we just have to remove a few more T30s from the valve body. With all of them removed from the perimeter, there's one right here. Do this one last and hold the valve body or it will fall out. Get both hands in there. It's not heavy, but you don't want this to fall. It will be pretty much ruined. You're gonna lose some more transmission fluid from the trans also. So I just like to flip these over, kind of let everything drain for like five minutes. All right, so with the valve body on the bench, we can go ahead and remove all the solenoids. And these are the blue top AMG solenoids that come on here. You'll see uh, the non-AMG cars, I think they have brown tops. And you could upgrade your non-AMG car with the blue tops, but it's really expensive. I think the solenoids are a couple hundred dollars and uh, it's not worth it, honestly. Probably won't notice too big of a difference. And if you do, it's on a non-AMG car. So I mean, unless you're chasing every 10th at the quarter mile, I'd probably just save your money. Okay, then there's just some tabs here. So we pull up on this tab here, flip it around. And it just kind of pops up out of place just like that. And with the solenoids removed, you could simply replace your old conductor plate with a brand new conductor plate. And you can think of this part as an electronic circuit board for your transmission. So the electrical connector plugs in right here. It's connected to the transmission control unit, which controls the solenoids and ultimately controls all the functions of your transmission. Now this part does have a speed sensor on it that does fail and when it does, your car gets put into limp home mode. And then this is what you have to replace to fix that. So these do periodically go bad. Uh, I don't have any service history on this ever being done. So it's kind of a ticking time bomb and it's pretty inexpensive to do. And you can get the entire kit from FCP Euro with literally everything you need, which is really nice. So you get your pan gasket, you get your little plug cap, you get a new electrical connector because they know these fail all the time. Even if you have the updated part, just replace that. You get your new filter and obviously your conductor plate as well. So I'll leave a link down below to all this stuff. FCPEuro.com lifetime parts replacement warranty is awesome. And that way you never have to worry about it again. So before we install this, I do wanna show you one extra step I'm taking here. And that is to replace a couple of little sleeves that go inside of the valve body. So let me go ahead and remove one of these and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Okay, in order to get to these parts, we have to remove a plate. So it's just a few T20s. Now there's a spring behind here, so be careful. When you take your last one out, it could all shoot out. You gotta pay really close attention to what you're removing whenever you're working on a valve body. It can be kind of confusing. So if you don't feel comfortable doing this, by all means, just don't do it. But could be very beneficial and save you a lot of money. When you get to that last screw, it's really when you wanna hold this plate with your thumb. There's quite a bit of pressure going on here. So just make sure you have full control over this plate so you can remove it slowly. There we go. And for the most part, this spring right here is what's pushing back at you. There's a few other ones, but that's the one that's giving you pressure. So you just don't want that to shoot out. Okay, so from there, we're gonna remove this little spring and we're gonna remove this little sleeve right here. And do you guys see the wear marks on this sleeve? Just a little worn out. Basically, there are many valves inside of your transmission 
and uh, these valves have to direct fluid to make shifts happen and whatnot. And eventually, parts can get worn out inside of the valve body and fluid will leak around them. So when you have transmission fluid leaking internally inside of your valve body, this can open up a whole world of issues from delayed shifts to harsh shifts to stuttering and a whole bunch of other things. So if you're having any of these concerns with a 722.6 transmission, these overlap sleeves can really help you. And let me show you the difference. All right, so first and foremost, what we're gonna do is swap over this little plunger. And next, we're gonna install an O-ring. And this is the big difference. So with these aftermarket sleeves, they come with O-rings. And so that way, if the valve body does have some internal wear, because we saw the wear on the outside of the overlap sleeve, but what that means is that there was wear inside of the valve body itself. So instead of replacing an expensive valve body for these issues, we add this O-ring and now that's gonna keep our fluid nice and contained and controlled so it's going where it needs to go inside of our valve body. So with the O-ring on, I'm just gonna dab it in a little cap with transmission fluid so it's nice and lubricated. And then we're simply going to reinstall it. It's gonna be a little bit harder to install as you can imagine with the O-ring and then put our little spring back in. Then we're just gonna go ahead and reinstall the plate, which you are gonna to have to fight against the spring here. So it's kind of a balancing act. Get one of your screws ready to go, preferably towards the middle. And we'll just get that started. Don't cross thread anything here. Valve bodies are pretty delicate. And we'll just start this guy. I don't use any power tools on valve bodies either. And then just so we're not flexing this plate, we'll get a few more in there before we start cranking these things down. All right, we've got these guys all tightened up by hand now. And with all these screws nice and snug, we have our quarter drive torque wrench. And I will leave all the specs down below, all the torque specifications for all the bolts I'm doing here, the valve body, these bolts, the pan bolts, everything. You guys wanna do this at home. And of course, I'll leave you guys a link to where you can get these valves and the instructions, but it's very easy. I don't have this memorized or anything. They tell you exactly the location of each one of these. The master overhaul kit comes with three of these guys and three O-rings. So we just did the one to two, four to five O-ring sleeve. It goes right there. And we know which one to use because it only has one notch. The next one we're gonna do is the two to three overlap. It says it has two notch IDs. And what they're referring to aren't these larger notches, they're these smaller ones, one here and one up here. All right, so same thing here. We have a spring that we're fighting. And the issue I was having with the CL65 transmission was primarily when it was cold, uh, on the one to two shift, it would make the shift and then it would just kind of bounce you back and forth. So it's kind of like a shuddering right after it made the shift. And it's a pretty common issue that gets fixed by these valves. And another one I fixed with these valves was I had a 210 chassis E55 AMG and it straight up felt like the transmission was slipping, uh, like really bad. And I'm like, ah, this thing's gonna need a transmission. Let me just try this, and it worked. And I drove that car daily for like three years after, and it was fine. All right, so now we're gonna remove this spring here, and this sleeve. Let's take a look at the condition here. Yeah, look at this one, it's pretty worn out. And that means the inside of the valve body is worn out and leaking. So we have our two to three with the two notches. We'll swap over this little plunger on the inside. Just like that, we'll lube it up, reinstall it, just like that, put our spring back, and now the plate. So you guys get the idea. Okay, so right now we're doing the three to four overlap sleeve. Take a spring out. And then gently slide this guy out, let's see. And right on par with the other one, so definitely worn out. And I know it could be intimidating to work on a transmission, but seriously, you guys can definitely do this at home. This whole kit is like $50 and it'll fix some concerns that most people would think is simply a bad transmission. So before you spend literal thousands of dollars on a transmission, you might wanna look into these. And you guys saw exactly how to do it right here. It's not hard at all. And you guys can see exactly how worn out it is on the inside. You can see those shiny marks right there. That is the wear I'm talking about. Now I did have one case where this didn't fix the issue, didn't fix the valve body, and I had to replace the valve body and that was on my CDI. Some of you guys may have remembered I had a 2005 E320 CDI, a diesel Mercedes, uh, same transmission and same deal. And it had some really bad shifting characteristics just all over the place. I did this kit, I did the torque converter lockup solenoid and it still, it was pretty much fixed. Like no lights were coming on, no limp home mode. Most people would be okay with it, but I knew it was just slightly off. 
and I ended up putting a different valve body. Actually, I put an E55 valve body in there um, because I replaced the valve body in my other E55. Yeah, that's how it worked. So that car got an E55 valve body, totally fixed everything. So there are some situations uh, where the inside of the valve body is just too worn out to repair. And a lot of that comes from this lifetime fluid. So you get a lot of grit in the fluid and it just wears out the valve body. It's made of aluminum over time because the valves are moving back and forth and kind of grinding that stuff in like sandpaper. So that's why you should definitely replace your transmission fluid and filter no matter what. Uh, I like to do it about every 50, 60,000 miles on the 722.6. And then there's some different intervals for the 722.9, the transmission after that. I'll leave a video I made uh, linked down below on the entire process and how to do a fluid and filter flush on those. It's, it's different than this. You gotta fill it from the bottom. But anyway, uh, let me get this valve body wrapped back up. We'll get it back in the CL. And then uh, I think that's it. We just gotta bleed coolant, install a fan, and we can go test drive this thing. All right, so then the conductor plate just kind of snaps right back into place. All right, it's got a little clip here and one here. So as long as both ends are solid, you're good. And then it's just a matter of reinstalling your solenoids the same way you took them out. Throw your retainers back on. Just be gentle. If you're using a gun, you're gonna do your final torque by hand. All right, with everything reassembled, we're just going back together now. And I'm gonna show you guys how to flush out all the fluid from the transmission here in a moment. Because if we're gonna do all this work, we might as well get it all out and just do a complete service. And then we're done for a very long time. Be gentle with the gun, we're not using that to actually tighten anything. All right, so the valve body is torqued except for one bolt, because we're gonna install this adapter and it gets secured with one of the valve body bolts like that. Zip it in there. Then we're gonna screw in this valve and it's got an O-ring at the top, so it's gotta be screwed in all the way like that. Just hand tight is fine. Then we have this adapter, it just fits in like so. Okay, and then with this valve shut, we're gonna hook up shop air, just like that. And we're just gonna open this a little bit you can hear some gurgles. And what we're doing here is we're gonna send air. Ah, I'm gonna move this out of the way. We're sending air through the transmission. We're gonna pump out all the old fluids. So this is gonna get the torque converter. This is gonna get everything. You can also turn this regulator up a little bit. I have this regulator set really low. I'm just gonna let this go for ah, about 15, 20 minutes. It'll slowly but surely get all the fluid out. Okay, so we got all the fluid out. Now we're just gonna install the new transmission filter. All right, then we're gonna install our new electrical connector. I like to lubricate these seals a little bit too. This part will kind of point down and don't just go jamming it in there. You kind of gotta make sure it fits in the grooves. You'll feel it snap in. And it's gonna be a tight fit. That was part of their fix. It was just closing up the tolerances. You'll feel it go past the two seals Then you're in. And then definitely do not use any power tools on this. You will strip out the screw if you try that. So just do it by hand. Just give it a little snug, just like that. We're good. Make sure the mating surface is free of oil. And then you can reinstall your transpan with a new gasket. These bolts only get torqued to like eight Newton meters. So again, don't go nuts with the gun. Remember, replace the seal for the drain plug or it could leak. All right, with the transmission repairs all done, we can get our fan back in. So I reconnected the lower transmission cooler line leave the top one disconnected so we can slide this guy in. And we wanna be a little bit more careful on the way in, just to not mess up our new radiator. Okay, there we go. Tighten up the fan, install our air filters. These things should make some noise in the dyno. Not sure if they'll make any more power though. I'll bring the stock air boxes so we can test that out too. Uh, we'll see how far we get on the dyno. I'm just always so worried about this car. Will there be any issues? There's a percentage chance. 50%, I'd say, at this point. Who knows? All right, so the coolant is full. I'm just topping her up with transmission fluid, and I'll show you guys how to check this with a special dipstick tool when we get to the dyno. Mercedes didn't have dipsticks for some reason back then. Um, but first, I just want to go for a ride and put some miles on this thing before the dyno. So let's see how it runs. Let's see how it shifts. Let's kind of look over everything, make sure it's ready to go. And then we're heading out. Fire in the hole. Right. 
setting the Distronic cruise control and we have no messages on the cluster. It is a beautiful day and the CL is just running and driving perfectly. Oh, I hope I'm not jinxing myself for this dyno. I'm always nervous when it comes to running a car on a dyno, especially one that we haven't put too many miles on. But let's just remember this cluster right now as the Distronic radar cruise control slows me down. For being a first generation system, it works pretty well on the highway. All right guys, we're on the dyno here at Fluid Motor Union. I'm a little nervous, I'm not gonna lie. I'm always nervous on the dyno, but especially on a build that really has no test miles. I, yeah, just I'm just nervous, as most people would be. But uh, I wanna check the transmission fluid. We did the service, but I didn't have the specialty dipstick because Mercedes doesn't give you a dipstick, so you have to have the tool, and I can't find mine, so of course Fluid has one. So this is a tool, I'll leave a link down below, but it's really easy. We're just gonna run this down the transmission dipstick tube. And it's right in the middle. So I've done transmission services uh, quite a few times, as you can imagine, on these cars, so I kinda knew what to put in there. But uh, you definitely wanna double check just to be on the safe side, and we're good. All right, so we gotta get this thing in dyno mode, so key to position one. And then we're just gonna hit the reset button three times and scroll up to this. There we go, ESP dynomometer test. Start it up and you should have a bunch of warning lights on. And that's good in this case. All right, so right now OJ's just setting up the dyno speed so everything is calculated properly. So right now he's just doing some quick blips here just to make sure everything is okay. We really wanna ease into this and watch AFR, which is actually pretty decent right now. It's right in like the 11.5 range, so that's safe, but there's no tune on the car right now, so we're just getting just some initial numbers. So yeah, I mean, this really doesn't mean all that much right now. Um, but on a dyno jet, like an unloaded dyno, a stock one, we'll put down, I think about 500, maybe 515 horsepower. So on this dyno, a stock one would put down like mid fours. So I know it's gonna look low, like pretty much all the cars we put on this loaded dyno. But in my opinion, this is the way to tune a car. It's a loaded dyno. You're gonna get more realistic load like you would have on the street or the track. So we're not gonna see any crazy numbers and we're gonna be easing into this little by little, uh, but at least we'll know it's done right once the tune is finalized. Oh, and if you guys are wondering, yes, I did get some hardware right there and on the other side. So we are properly holding in all of these many, many coolers. All right, just another quick one, 425. And these V12 cars are very hard to dyno. OJ had to add a few more straps back there. Uh, they just make such crazy torque that they'll spin the tires on the dyno or try to come off. All right, guys, so we got 428 on that one. Keep in mind, this is the totally stock tune, zero tuning thus far and it is running richer because we have larger fuel injectors that haven't been accounted for. So it runs fine because the O2 sensors are able to adjust for normal driving, uh, but at wide open throttle, it's just injecting more fuel than we're supposed to have. It's really safe, but it's not really good uh, for power. So right now, the modifications I've made with the hybrid turbos and the injectors, which are really like the only two power modifications I've made, it's still running a totally factory exhaust, um, but none of these modifications are being utilized right now. If anything, we're lower than factory horsepower because it's running richer. Um, but something I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna swap back to the factory intake system. So like I told you before, this was a prototype system from VRP uh, and it definitely sounds cool, but it's not meant to make any more power. Um, and since it was a prototype, it doesn't have any mounting tabs or anything like that. And it's getting kind of loose on there. So I'm gonna report back my findings to them. And for now we're gonna run the factory air boxes and I get to put back the cool carbon fiber engine cover with the little plaque with the guy's name on it. So anyway, let me swap these. All right, guys, we are back together with the factory air boxes and the carbon fiber cover. The little AMG dealie with, what's this guy's name again? G Straussenhofen. So that looks pretty awesome, I'm not gonna lie. I really like that. All right, so right now we're gonna go for another blast, but in typical CL65 fashion, uh, we are running into some issues, some pretty major issues in the world of tuning, and that is we're not able to write a file. So we have been logging this entire time, just kind of easing into the throttle, being real gentle. We don't want anything to blow up. Um, so we're getting the logs to the tuner. It's a remote tuner, um, but we can't write. And I was talking with OJ, and this is an older ME. So the E55 7 ME 2.8. Uh, this one has an ME 2.7, that's just the engine's computer. We might have to send the computer out for the tune, which 
would not be fun. Then any kind of adjustment we want to make, we have to literally mail the computer out and then wait for it to come in. This is uh, just kind of unfortunate in the world of modifying older Euro cars. So OJ's tuned a few of the newer 65s where you don't have to do that. And these 05s and 06s, there's like a couple hundred of them. No one really messes with them, especially with aftermarket turbos and different fuel systems and everything. So uh, yeah, we got to do a little bit more research, see what we can figure out. But I don't know if we're going to be able to get to any tuning right now because we can't write any software. We're going to go for a rip though with the uh, factory air boxes to see what the sound difference is. Yeah, pretty much sounds stock. You really can't hear anything at all. So the turbo sounds are pretty good with the cones, um, but I don't think it's gonna make a big difference with power. I mean, this really means nothing at all at this point because we're just going real gentle into the throttle. So yeah, 417 on that one. But that's probably not because of the factory air boxes. We only let it cool down for like 10 minutes. And these things kind of heat soak pretty bad. I think the car would benefit from larger intercoolers, um, but let's uh, let's figure out tuning before we get into any more hard parts. Well guys, unfortunately, that'll do it for today on the dyno. There's really not much we can do at the moment. We have to do a little bit more research and figure out uh, if we can flash this thing or not. So. Uh, we did about five runs on the dyno. Most of them were just 50% throttle. We went, I think, up to like 70 or 75% throttle. Um, but we got enough info to start tuning, but we couldn't. And we don't really want to push our luck with this. So I'd much rather just leave and come back later with a CL65 that still has an engine intact uh, than try to play around with going wide open throttle to see what the numbers would actually be at this point. Uh, but we do know that it's overfueled by about 20, 25%, which is a lot. Um, and it is running the stock boost and everything. So the car didn't have a tune before. We were wondering if maybe someone had done like a Rentec tune or something on it previously and they didn't, it's totally stock. Anyway, we have to figure out some tuning stuff. And once again, it's hurry up and wait on the CL65. I was really hoping to get some numbers on this car to get it tuned and to just blast it on the highway and just finally have fun with this thing. It's been like a year now since I bought it, but uh, yeah, it'll be, a I don't know, a couple more weeks or something until we can get back out here. Even though I'm a little disappointed, we still have no messages on the dash. I've put about 100 miles on it in the last couple of days. It's a beautiful day. I'm gonna open up the sunroof, jam out to some tunes, got all the windows open, and it may not have a million horsepower just yet, <laughs> but I'm still gonna have some fun. So anyway, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this video nonetheless. If you did, give it a big thumbs up, share the video with your friends, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and most importantly, have an awesome day. I'll catch all of you in the next video. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Made it about five miles, check engine light. Wonderful, wonderful. I'll let you guys know what that is in the next video. Still running strong though, so that's good.